Happy to see you all. Yes, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. We are so happy to have you recording our, <laughs> our beautiful session. Thank you. Oh. Welcome everybody. Happy to see you all together in front of us, sharing our beautiful session. Welcome. Hi. So welcome to the women's learning group of the Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue, Montreal. Today is Wednesday, November 16, 2022, 22 Heshvan 5783. We are having a great presentation by our wonderful high school art instructor Od of Loyola, Audrey Bernard. By the way, Audrey lives in the same building where I am living. And a few years ago, when I just moved, there was a barbecue party and they put me near her and her husband. When I said my name, her husband is a doctor and my daughter is a doctor. He told me, I trained your, doctor, your daughter. <laughs> so he recognized me from the name. And then Audrey told me, and what do you do? I told her about our group and our work. She told me, I want to be your speaker. And <laughs> so she volunteered twice already. Every time she gives us one session, our people ask her to come again. They get fascinated by the way she presents to us everything so beautiful. And then we had the pandemic. Period. Oh, and also Audrey volunteered to give us once a week an art session in our building. And we all enjoy it. She gives us always a free of her time to, to enlighten everybody around her. And we all love it and she brings us together. Thank you, Audrey. So today, our topic is French Impressionists on PowerPoint, I assume. And that was the topic that the last time when Audrey was with us, our group asked her to come again and talk about this topic. So it is not my choice, it's not Audrey's choice. <laughs> <laughs> it was the group's choice. And thank you, Audrey, for giving us what uh, the group asked. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Our next week presentation will be on Thursday. Please remember, next week will be on Thursday, not Wednesday. As per the speaker's availability, we couldn't come on Wednesday, so I accepted Wednesday. Thursday. Thursday, yes, Thursday. Next week, Thursday, November 24 at 10, like today. The topic is archaeology in Jerusalem, and that would be Professor David Ben Susan. Also, he was several times already, and we always come back to him with a different topic. And, and he sent us every week something to read. It will be followed by the beautiful musical session of our Reverend Daniel Ben Lolo. And it was back, back to Wednesday. And we end with uh, our lawyer, Alan Murad, that we had to cancel it to was the person we canceled it. So they will be always on Wednesday. The next week will be Thursday. Okay, so now 
Uh, oh, by the way, Alan Morad will clarify for us Build 96 as for our request. Now I would like to invite our Gigi Biton to tell us a few words about Audrey Berner's biography. Okay, Gigi with pleasure. Gigi Biton, <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'd like to introduce Audrey, Audrey Berner, who began teaching in 1973. Can you hear me, by the way? Yes, yes, okay. loud and clear. So uh, Audrey Berner began teaching in 1973, and since that time, she has worked in seven different schools in various provinces, such as Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. She has also worked for the Faculty of Education at McGill, McGill University. Uh, she began as a teacher of English language arts and history and has often been expected to work outside her comfort zone by teaching such diverse subjects as geography, ESL, which is English as a second language, media studies, Catholic studies, and middle school math. Audrey has trained teachers to become instructors, instructors in ELA and media studies. She has written curricula and has been on the ground floor of research into digital learning. However, her greatest joy as a teacher has been in the challenges presented by becoming a visual arts teacher about 20 years ago and in creating a secondary school architectural design course in the last 10 years. Now retired from the formal classroom, Audrey Berner continues to volunteer in high school. Her husband and she remain active in their synagogue and do community work. Uh, their son and his family also live in Montreal, so the Burners can spoil their grandchildren whenever they want. Their daughter and her family, however, live in Western Canada. And I have one question, and that is, what synagogue do you belong to, or are Darche you involved in? Darche Amet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Beautiful person. Now I would like to invite our lovely speaker, Audrey Berner. Audrey Berner, Bebakasha Bechavod. Tadaraba. Um, I'm going to start off with, uh, oh my God, I don't want to be spotlighted. Um, I want to be able to see everybody. I just unspotlighted me. Don't worry about that. You, you can keep it spotlighted for everybody else. Um, wow, I'm going to start off. Beautiful, Audrey. It, please, please, Gladys. We want to see you. Yeah, you can see me. I don't want to. Um, I want to see everybody else. Um, I'm going to start off with an apology. Um, some of you may be, well, maybe nobody's aware. I went through quite an ordeal uh, about four months ago, and one of my remaining side effects is my voice. Um, I was intubated for several days and I had damage to the vocal cords. Um, I will cough a lot because I cough when I talk, but I have cough drops and I have water and I've got Kleenex and you'll just bear with me. Also, my voice will crack because uh, the vocal cords were quite damaged. So I wanna start off with that as an apology um, for periodically interrupting myself to cough. Um, secondly, those of you who have not been on a Zoom session with me before, um, I am very informal. I don't mind being interrupted at any time. I would prefer that you stay muted uh, as, uh, but, if you want to say something, um, if you're on a laptop, just press the space bar and you can talk. Or if you're on an iPad, I'm afraid you're going to have to actually physically unmute yourself. Um, but please jump in at any point, ask a question, uh, make a comment, uh, whatever it is that you'd like to do. I don't like to do this very formally. I, I'm a 
I'm a teacher, I'm a high school teacher. Teenagers don't wait for you to tell them that it's time to ask questions. They do it whenever they want. And I think that's very cool. So those are my, my um, caveats to start. Uh, and I am going to share my screen and talk to you about the French Impressionists. Um, when Gladys asked me to do this talk, she said, the Impressionists, the Impressionist movement is massive. There is no way I could do it in an hour. Um, so I decided to limit it to the French Impressionists only, who were the people who founded the movement. Um, but then I realized I couldn't even talk about all the French Impressionists because that would take more than an hour. So um, I'm limiting it. I, this is very superficial. Uh, if you ever want more, you need but ask. So I'm going to start out by telling you that the very first Impressionist painting ever created was one called Impression Sunrise. Well, that's the English name for it. Um, it was obviously in French uh, because it came in France. And it's not often that you can set a date to an art movement. But in this case, we absolutely can because this was the first Impressionist painting ever created and it was created in 1872. You know it? Okay, it was painted by Monet and uh, by Claude Monet and it is um, the harbor in, um, in La Havre uh, in obviously dawn. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the technique and then we're going to come back and look at this picture again. Um, this particular painting, Impression of, Impression of Sunrise or Impression Sunrise, not only began the movement of Impressionism, but it also began the whole modernist movement. Because at this moment, when this painting was done, Everything about art changed completely and very dramatically. So um, it's important to know in 1872, everything changed. But it didn't change because of this painting. It changed because of this. And you may ask, what on earth am I looking at? And you would be very fair to ask. This is a photograph. It was actually created in 1827. It didn't stand the test of time very well. So I'm going to show you an enhanced version. Um, this is a photograph taken by Niesefor Niepce, and it's called Point de vue de Grâce à Saint-Luc de Varennes. Um, Nepce was not a photographer per se, he was a chemist. And the chemists were playing around with, is there a way to put light and preserve it? And they were experimenting with all kinds of different techniques using often glass and painting it with various noxious chemicals and then trying to see you know, what would happen. Um, and they discovered that it was possible. Uh, you'd have to keep this little box um, situated in some place for like, you know, eight hours, but you could actually get a permanent picture. Though you can see that this particular pic per bah, picture did not, it, well, it's not permanent. <laughs> Though you can see the shapes, I mean, <laughs> you can see the roof lines a little bit still. This, uh, this actual picture, which is uncopyable, uh, is in University uh, Library uh, in Texas. I don't know which one, but anyway, doesn't matter. Um, this particular plate, Nepce used a pewter board, pewter, it's not a board, I guess, but a pewter plate, and he painted it with um, a chemical called butamen of Judea, which I thought was rather funny. Uh, considering, you know, we're a Jewish group and we're talking about not Jewish things. Uh, but it's a it's an ancient uh, chemical asphalt, actually. 
Um, and he discovered that <laughs> there's, well, there's silver in it, silver nitrate in it. And he discovered that if you expose this plate to sunlight, the silver, silver nitrate will fade where there's more light, thus a photograph. Um, so he plunked his little box with the butamen of Judea painted on the pewter plate. He stuck it in the window of his attic and walked away, spent his day, went and had lunch, visited with friends, came back eight hours later and produced this. Now, why is this so dramatic? Because photography changed everything. People would go, so uh, explain to me why I should sit for an artist, pay billions of bucks, wait, you know, four hours a day or two hours a day for like a week when I can go into a studio and get this picture taken in, oh, I don't know, 45 minutes. That's how long that poor little girl had to stand there. And that's why this is a this this is a daguerreotype. Um, if you still have pictures at home that are on hard cardboard, I have a few uh, of my great grandparents. Um, they were they were done by a, another chemist called Daguerre, um, and uh, he figured out that you could do the technique. You could put people in front of a camera for only like forty five minutes, maybe an hour which is why nobody is smiling in those old pictures. You try and hold a smile for an hour? <laughs> try and hold a smile for more than 30 seconds? And that's why they're always leaning against something. Because, and you should see, I have a picture in another presentation of a chair with this long back and a thing that goes around the neck so that someone could sit there for the whole time that it took. But it was still easier and less expensive to do this. I'm pointing to my second screen. I'm sorry. Just, I'm not pointing at anything in particular except that little girl. Um, she was awfully patient, isn't she? Like she's what, six? Um, but in any case, um, people loved uh, the new technique. They loved it. They, they flocked to, to photography studios and photographers came to them. Uh, photographers would be on the move and they would carry their dark rooms with them on, on, in carriages. Um, but there were a group of artists who were really upset by this, Monet included, who said, hmm, we are ruined. Yeah, people don't mind standing for an hour and get a black and white photograph, but it's cheaper. We have to figure out a way to paint fast so that people will not avoid us because a painting was still more fun and more accurate and more colorful than early photography. So they figured that what they needed to do was to be able to come up with a, a style of painting. And I don't, I don't know if it was that conscious that they said, this is what we need to do, but they came up with a style of painting in which they could complete a piece of work in an hour or an hour and a half. And so we get work like this. Now, if you look at this piece of work, you know what you're looking at. It's a haystack or a hay rick, I guess you'd call it. Um, but nothing is obvious. Um, if you look, for example, at the trees and then the two houses back here, and I'll just make it a little bit bigger so you can actually see those two houses. You know they're there, you recognize them as houses, but they were done really, really, really fast. So what Monet and his gang did is they came up with works that only captured the impression of what you were looking at rather than the reality of what you were looking at. There's the haystack up close, the hay rick. And you Audrey, can see, yeah. Um, their concern was the play of light on objects. I'm gonna to get to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, this, I'm just trying to get, give you some background here, okay? But yes, you're absolutely right. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, Monet's uh, series of, of haystacks done at different times of day. Same haystack, but morning, noon, night, midnight, sunset, and all that sort of stuff. 
But what I'm asking you to look at here is the not necessarily accurate coloring, um, the very quick brush strokes. You can see the, you, well, you can't see it because I'm up close and you can't see my cursor. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, the fast, they paint it quickly, they paint it outdoors. And this was entirely different from anything that had ever been done before. This was the way things had been done before. Um, in, the in the late 19th century, um, you painted intricate, detailed scenes. Um, you, if you were an artist, you received huge commissions to paint things that could hang in people's homes um, or the government, a lot of you know, huge art pieces that were in uh, government buildings or the homes of you know, Premier Ministre and, and, and those kind of people. And the only way artists at that time could become successful was if they showed their paintings at something called the Salon, the Salon de Paris, Salon de France. And it was the place to go, and you didn't count unless you had had at least one work showing <laughs> at the Salon. Um, you found new patrons at the Salon. You were approved by the Salon. Um, and the Salon was, was pretty limited. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> The Salon was pretty limited in the kinds of things they accepted because the work had to be religious, mythological, or moral. <laughs> you can imagine that Monet and his gang would not have been approved by the Salon and never were. <laughs> so the group of artists who became known as the Impressionists had to reject the salon and because they weren't they weren't welcome but what do you do you're not going to be acknowledged unless you're showing in the salon so how do you reject in traditional art in a place like paris and the answer is you don't but you do it anyway because when you're passionate about something that you do you do it no matter what. So what the group of artists who became known as the Impressionists did is they showed at another gallery. They put their stuff up on another gallery at another gallery, not the Salon. And they were not approved of. Let me share a couple of quotations with you. I will read it just in case uh, it's not big enough for you. I don't like reading from PowerPoints, but some people have trouble reading them. So impression. This critic was named Louis Leroy, and he was not impressed. He said, impression, I was certain of it. I was just telling myself that since I was impressed, there had to be some impression in it. And what freedom, what ease of workmanship, wallpaper in its embryonic state is more finished than that seascape. This is not complimentary. Another critic, Albert Wolf, said, and he was talking specifically about a work shown by Pissarro, try to make Monsieur Pissarro understand that trees are not violet, that the sky is not the color of fresh butter, and that no sensible human being could countenance such aberrations. Try to explain to Monsieur Renoir that a woman's torso is not a mass of decomposing flesh with those purple green stains. Gigi is laughing and it's absolutely true. The critics lambasted this stuff. They hated this stuff at the beginning. Um, and as I'm going to explain as we go on, um, it obviously became you know, the norm rather than the exception. But what I would like to do right now is introduce you to just a few of the people that they were criticizing. There's no way I can do them all, even if I talk about the French, only the French. But I will introduce you to, well, the ones that I like the best, 
why not? So I'm going to start with Claude Monet, um, who was the founder of the movement because his painting of the shore in, um, or the port, I should say, in Le Havre, started the movement. He was born there. He was born in Le Havre. Um, he wanted to be an artist, but when he went to art school, he didn't like what they were doing. It was, a, it was you know, traditional stuff. It was awful. Um, and he fell in love with the work of John Turner. And I'm going to talk about the work of John Turner in a, in a minute or two. Um, John Turner was a very untraditional landscape artist. I'll talk about him. Um, and so Monet tried to work like Turner, but he couldn't get anything shown at the Salon. Nobody was interested. They all went, eh. Um, his wife died in 1883, uh, not Turner's. Uh, Monet's, um, and he um, rented a house in Givernay in 1883, just after his wife died. He bought it in 1890. Um, his son, they're, they're his children, his three boys went to a school right near there, and he loved the fact that there was an old barn that he could use as his studio, so it was a very handy place. Um, now, as Monet became more and more well-known, he came into a bit more money, so he was actually wealthy enough to create at Givernet exactly what he wanted to paint. So I like painting water lilies. Let's make a water lily pool. I want to paint a Japanese garden. Let's make a Japanese, you know, garden area. Um, and it seems, and I think this is fascinating, he had, you know, a whole ream of gardeners. And every day he told them what he wanted them to do, he would write it all out. So today you're going to plant six more water lily or whatever it might be. <coughs> um, he kept invoices. He kept designs of, of the various gardens he wanted. He had botany books. Um, and he had actually somewhere about seven or eight gardeners working full time uh, so that he could paint. Then he decided he had to, he didn't have enough land because he didn't, for example, the water lilies, he needed more land. He bought a water meadow and he brought the water lilies in from China <clears throat> so that he could paint them. Um, and any flower that he wanted to paint and if he couldn't find the right colors locally, he would import the flower. This is a, this is a man who was dedicated to what he's doing. Um, here's a photograph of him in front of the Japanese garden. You've all seen paintings of, uh, of that bridge um that he uh he incorporated in a whole lot of stuff um and here's another photograph of him in the barn in the studio and there's one of his water lily pieces uh which is very very long <laughs> and i love his oversized palette it's uh it's really quite something and his comfy couch <clears throat> okay i'm going to move on to Pierre Auguste Renoir, um, and Renoir also has a fascinating story, which I'm going to tell you very, very briefly. He started out as a musician, not an artist, um, and he ran out of money. <laughs> you don't make money as a musician. So he went to work as at a porcelain factory where he was hired to paint porcelain. Oh, look, I can do this, he discovered. Um, he met Monet, and then he started to paint. And he actually, he called himself an Impressionist. He hung out with the Impressionists, um, but he was also influenced by other artists like a man named Sisley and a man named Manet who were not Impressionists. They were post-Impressionists, which I'm not talking about today. Um, so his work was not always the same as others. Um, he put a lot of people into his work um, and um, though it was not, portraiture, um, the people were more important than the landscape. And he always worked outside, so that made him more of an Impressionist. And here, for example, um, are two pieces of his work. Um, the one over here, the one on the, on the right side is older, and the one on the left side is, was, came later. They were both titled The Bathers, and you can see how his style has evolved from this one, which is far more realistic, far more um, traditional, if you will, 
to this one, which is far more impressionistic. And these ones, you cannot see clear faces. You can't see clear structures. Even our backgrounds are not as, well, they're much fuzzier. They're much more impressionistic. So you can see a real evolution in, uh, in the Nenoir's work. And I'm going to come back to his stuff also. Any questions yet? Have I bored you all to tears? I can't see everybody on the screen. So um, if you have a question, please unmute and yell at me. Okay, because otherwise I may not know that you're talking to me. Edgar Degas, um, often not considered an impressionist, but he actually was. Um, a bit younger than some of the others. You can see him, he lasted well into the 20th century. Um, before um, the uh, Franco-Prussian War, which happened around the turn of the century, his work was very traditional. Um, and he was a salon painter. When he came back um, from the war, on his way back, which I don't understand how he made it there, he lived in Italy and in New Orleans. It seems to be a long way to go from the Franco-Prussian War back to Paris via New Orleans, but there it is. Um, he joined the Impressionists, but he'd never once painted outdoors. That was the one thing he was not about to do. I don't like mosquitoes. I don't know what his reasoning was. Um, and his compositions, as many of you know, are about dancers. Uh, though there are early compositions of things like horse races and fox hunts and stuff like that. Um, he was also a sculptor and he was also a photographer. What made him an impressionist was the fact that his canvases were rough. They were un unusual layouts. They were looked unfinished. And uh, so he was sort of an impressionist, but I happen to like his stuff. So we're talking about it. One of his most famous sculptures is this one called uh, The Little Dancer. Um, I, saw, I saw it in Montreal about, when was the Impressionist exhibit here? Five years ago, maybe? Five or six years ago, does anybody remember? Sandra's nodding, so am I close? Okay. Um, there was a lot of criticism about this piece. Um, first of all, her face is not exactly pretty. Uh, they call it the monkey face. Um, but also um, the hair is real. And on the sculpture, he's used real clothing. It's a real ballet costume. So it's a bronze sculpture with real hair and real clothing. So it's considered to be, nobody seems to know exactly what it is. Now there's this wonderful story about, you know, this little 14 year old ugly girl who used to model for him. Uh, there's novels about it. Nobody knows if any of that is true, but there it is. I'm going to talk about Berthe Morisseau. Um, when I decided I needed to talk about women impressionist artists, the first one that comes to mind is Mary Cassatt because she's the most famous, but she wasn't French. So she lived in Paris, but she was an American. So I decided not to talk about her, but I like Berthe Morisseau anyway. Um, she was, you know, a typical educated lady who knew a little bit about embroidery and a little bit about piano playing and a little bit about sketching, you know, the kind, the, the upper class 19th century educated woman. But what she loved to do was to paint. Very radical, very unusual. Um, but like the Impressionists, she worked with a limited palette um, and she used a lot of white. Um, which is a very opaque color. Uh, opaque, you can't, not, light doesn't shine through it, it bounces. Um, and she herself was painted by Manet, who was the uh, post-impressionist. Uh, but what she tried to do was capture the people like, like uh, Renoir. She was after people, though she did paint in plein air. Um, she died very young, as you can see, and it was, uh, she had pneumonia. She died of pneumonia. So let me ask a question. <clears throat> what exactly was so radical? And in order to do this, I just have to run and get some paintbrushes because I was going to do this before and I didn't. So watch Audrey flash off the screen and flash back in.
paintbrushes. Okay. We all good? Second screen people I can't see, all good? Okay. Excellent. All right. Let's look at the techniques that were used by the Impressionists. Traditionally, um, there's a lot of text here and I apologize for this, so I'll go through it real quickly. Um, the works that were accepted in the Salon, when I talk about traditional, I'm talking about Salon art. Very meticulous, you often didn't see the brush strokes because they were done with tiny, tiny little brushes and layers and layers and layers and layers of oil paint over it each other so that you couldn't see the brushwork. You were supposed to imagine that you were looking at something real and that um, it was a real place or a real person or you were looking through a real window at a real scene, um, whatever. Impressionists, not so much. They were trying to capture a moment. And you have to understand that because they're outside for most of the work, that moment didn't last very long because the sun moved. If you're painting indoors, you can adjust your light and you can keep it for as long as you want. If you're painting outdoors, you are dependent on the fact that the sun has, what, the 13 hour, 14 hour period from dawn to, to dusk. So you gotta move fast and you gotta work fast. So their brushwork was very obvious. Um, and they didn't worry about the fact that it was very obvious. This was part of the, the technique. And I wanna show you a piece by a painter we're not talking about in detail. This piece is by Passato and it's called Boulevard Montmartre at night. No, Montmartre, sorry. It was painted in 1897. Um, and what are we looking Audrey, at, anyone? Audrey. Yeah. Um, Pizarro, I just learned, was Jewish. Yes, yes. And, and he was key to bringing all of these young men together. Now that I did not know. Oh yeah, I just learned that. Um, I'll I, thought, you... I thought it was actually Monet, but you say it's Pizarro? Pizarro. Hmm, and I mean... he married um, the maid who was not Jewish and the mother, his mother was very angry. And, but anyway, um, he, he was brilliant. He ha and he, he's the one who got all of them together. And that made the strength because together, if they exhibit, they have much more, you know, uh, power. Well, that was the whole point. That's why they formed a group because you can't exhibit unless you're in a group. But it was Pizarro. The Jewish Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research that. But I want you to, what are we looking at here? It's obviously Paris because it's Montmartre. What time of day is it? Okay, all you muted people are not answering, but it's nighttime. What's the weather? Rainy? Evening. It's raining. Rainy. It's raining now. How do we know this? Let's take a close up. There is yeah. not a single brush stroke that looks like people, but you can see them walking on the street. There's the cars all lined up, but you can't see anything that looks real. Look at how he's done the shadowing with blues and yellows and a little bit of red and some green. And so if we go back to the distant picture, we know what we're looking at, but nothing, absolutely nothing is recognizable up close. So quick brush strokes, short brush strokes, et cetera. Okay. Here's another example. This is a Renoir. I think this may have been the piece they was talking about the dis dis disintegrating flesh. Um, Again, you cannot see um, figure details. You know you're looking at a woman. You know she's on a swing, mainly because you're being told. No, but you can see the swing. There's a child, but nothing is detailed. And look at the way he's done the shadows. Sorry, I'm going to have to back out so you can see my cursor. Look at the way he's done the shadows with blue paint. That's something else about the Impressionists. They did not use black ever. Black was too opaque for them. And I'm going to show you a Morisot called The Cradle. 
which is probably one of her most famous works. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of where she has used white. White is a very non-reflective color. Uh, sorry, non-luminescent color. It is reflective. The color bounces back um, rather than is the light is not absorbed the way it is in other colors. You have to be very careful using white. Um, it's a very difficult color to use when you're using oil paints. With acrylics, much easier, but with oil paints, very difficult. So the fact that she could master doing something transparent like the veil over the cradle <laughs> is pretty miraculous. That is her, by the way. Okay, since so I have about 15 minutes left and I'm never going to get there. Hopefully you don't mind if I go over, Gladys, no. I'm going to go over a little bit. Audrey, you can talk as much as you like. It's up to oh, you. Oh, oh, okay, well, I'm a good talker, so we're good here. Um, I love the way you explain things. It's really so easy to follow. It's oh, really thank nice. you. Again, it comes from, you know, teenagers. You got to keep them interested. Um, so the salon artists, the academic artists would use very rich color. They're using oil paint at this time. Acrylics had not yet been invented. Um, so rich colors, a lot of deep, dark shadow. Everything was very, very defined. Impressionists, however, used a lot of bright color. They used dirty brushes and they mixed their paint right on the canvas. Now, what do I mean by dirty brushes? Uh, I, get the, I got to use my paint brushes now. All right, so here's what happens. You're standing outside. You're not taking your whole bloody studio with you. So what do you take? You take a limited palette of bright colors, red, green, yellow, uh, blue, purple, or you mix them and you have a limited number of brushes. So if I were painting now, I would go, okay, I'm doing, there, let me, let me show you with, with this one, this one by Monet. Um, okay, so he grabs or mixes his purple or he would take some blue, dab it on the, the canvas or board. Sometimes they use board. And then he would take the same brush without cleaning it and dip it into um, the red or the burgundy or whatever color he had. And he would put it on top. So this is, this is dirty brush. He doesn't clean his brushes between. Now, partly it's because you can only take a few brushes. So why bother? Second is the only way to clean oil paints off is by using turpentine and linseed oil. Uh, difficult to carry. I mean, you had to, otherwise your brushes would be dead by the time you got back to your studio, but you carried as little as possible. So, you know, he might have his blue green and then he might, okay, this is for the yellows and I'm gonna use all my yellows and oranges and maybe some reds. And this one I'm gonna use for the dark, whatever it is. And you carry only two or three brushes with you when you go out into the field. This is known as dirty brush technique. Most people don't use it anymore. I sometimes do just because I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. I paint in acrylics and acrylics you can wash off with water, but I sometimes use it anyway, just because it's fast. Um, sometimes they don't even mix the colors. And if you look down here at, at the uh, um, irises, you will see, and again, I can't use my cursor because I've got a close up, um, the blue and the darker blues and the purples are more side by side than they are covering each other. And what Monet and followers are doing is letting our eyes do the color mixing because the, our eyes do that naturally. This became a very huge technique much later. Um, sorry, I didn't want to do that, go away. Um, influenced by um, a group of artists known as the uh, pointillists who would actually just put lots and lots of dots of color and not mix them at all. And our eyes did the mixing. Um, the really important, th I can put the brushes down now, the really important thing about um, the Impressionist work is the light. And Sandra was asking me if I would talk about, was it Sandra? Yeah, was asking me if I would talk about the light. Um, they wanted to look at the play of light in nature. So if you look, for example, the sun, you can tell it's right there. The path is brighter, the uh, irises are brighter, 
and then here there's here there's no sun or less sun and as you get further and further back you can see the shadow in the trees but the trees that are in front of us are much <coughs> brighter um, so the play of light on objects um, they look at things like reflection how do how does light reflect off an object and go to another object how you know, if a person is standing in front of a bright building, will their face be lighter? Things like that. They also looked really, really hard at um, shadow. This is by Sicily. And this is the church in a town called More. Please notice what color the shadow is. <coughs> the shadow is, in case you didn't notice, it's sort of a purpley Lavender. blue. Yeah lavender and <laughs> partly it's because that's the way it looks on a bright building and partially it's because they did not use the color black generally oh do i have a color wheel here god i'm not really prepared for this. i didn't bring my color oh there it is generally what an artist would do or what these artists would do, sorry, this is the side I want, would look at colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel. Um, and these are called complementary colors. I'll just get the, 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 well, green and red are the most, or two of the common ones. So uh, the red and the green, they're shocking together, which is why they're used as colors for Christmas. Um, they're very bright, but the interesting thing about red and green Okay, let me just give you a quick lesson. You know the primary colors? Anyone, what are the primary colors? Red, yellow. Red, yellow, yeah. and blue. And blue. Oh, blue, okay. These are, they're called the primary colors because they are the only colors that cannot be mixed. You have to buy them in that color. So there's a color called primary red, primary yellow, and primary blue is called cyan, C-Y-A-N. Um, and I think often primary red is called magenta. I like primary red. All right. <laughs> All of these three colors make up every other color that we have ever seen, which is kind of cool. Complementary colors, the complementary color of red are the other two primaries mixed together, which is blue and yellow. Mm -hmm. Comes are up to green. Green. So red and green are, are opposite colors, complementary colors. If I use blue as my first color, the complementary color is green and no, and it's red. red and orange, which uh, and orange. yeah, I just told you. Okay, red and yellow, red which and yellow is orange. orange. If my primary color is yellow, blue and red make purple. 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 Okay, so all the complementary colors are made up of the three primaries, one by itself and two mixed. Makes it really easy to understand what they are. So if I go on my color wheel and I go to purple, I will discover that the exact opposite, sorry, I don't know if you can see it. it I'm not there anymore. There I am, okay. Purple, it's yellow. The interesting thing is when you mix all three primary colors together, it goes sort of gray or brown, which is why instead of using the color black, they would paint one of the complementaries to create a darker shade. So if you look at the church, <clears throat> the church is, could somebody whose phone is ringing, please mute themselves or uh oh host could you mute them please okay thank you um the church which is a sort of a yellow color the shadow which is what's the primary purple and that's how the shadow is created in impressionist work we good mm -hmm. i'm moving on In traditional salon painting, nature didn't count, didn't matter. It was only used as a backdrop for the story. So that if the story was about death, there might be a storm in the background. Or if it was about happiness, there might be pretty trees in the background or whatever. It was only used 
the landscape was only used as a way to tell the story. People did not paint landscapes. They were not approved of in the Seminole. The Impressionists, however, wanted nothing to do with this. They said the, the landscape is the fun part, especially when you're painting outside and especially when it's different times of the day and especially when the light does really interesting things. So let's paint the landscapes as we see them. Let's paint the landscapes as they are without forcing them to do something unnatural. Like no landscape is going to tell you about the human condition. So let's let a landscape be a landscape. And I'm gonna give you some examples, obviously, because that's what I've been doing. Um, one of Monet's water lilies, this is a latish one. Um, and what I love about this one is that how, how brilliant the sky is in reflection in the water. Um, and this is one of the things that they played with an awful lot. They played with how does, how do, how do colors reflect? Um, and so what you get in a piece like Water Lilies of the Clouds is a feeling of light, a feeling of fresh. It, it's fresh, it's open, it's, it's dramatic. Um, and seeing as how it's, the weather outside is being very cooperative. Snow is not white. Uh, snow is colored. Um, and the color of snow depends on the color of the sky. Talk about reflection. So on a bright sunny day, that snow will look a lot bluer than it does today where the sky is gray. Take a look next time. Another Monet called Plum Blossoms. Look at the mountain. I'll get up close to it so you can take a look at it. I think it's better than the Plum Blossoms. Well, let's talk about the Plum Blossoms. Look again how the shadow and the light is working. Yeah, I'm gonna get out so you can see my cursor. The bright sun on the tops and the bottoms are not getting the sun, it must be midday. <coughs> with the sun high. And you can also tell, besides the fact that it's called plum blossoms, you can tell that it's early spring because um, the mountain trees are still, are still coming into, into the greenery. But then I got to talk about the haystacks. They were so entranced with the play of light on different objects that people, and Monet was probably the biggest among them, would go out and paint the same scene over and over and over at different times of day and night or evening, because you don't really paint much at night. Um, this is the haystack I showed you at the beginning at sunset. And here is the same haystack in morning. Now he stepped back a little bit further so that you can see two haystacks or maybe, um, I think the year might be different. So maybe, yeah, way many years later. So now there's two haystacks. Um, but the scene and the location are both the same. And there's way more of them. If I were just talking about Monet in an hour, I could show you all of them. Um, I can't. So you're just gonna have to deal with the two that I'm showing you, but it's all about light. Everything that the Impressionists did was about the light. And you can't paint light slowly. In half an hour, that light will have moved and the haystack will look different. One of the things that traditional art did was have very traditional composition. Composition is the way things are laid out on the, on the canvas. Um, I could talk about the rules of painting on a canvas. I'm not going to just take note that um, the action usually is in the center of the picture. Um, there's usually a group of figures. They're always central or symmetrical one way or the other. Um, the bodies of the people were always perfect. They were often 
identical. So, you know, you change heads and it's all the same person. Um, and it was always a story and they were very dramatic. Remember, you're doing mythology, um, moral issues or important people. The Impressionists, however, went, no, 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 no. Let's shake things up a little bit. Let's put pictures off center. Let's balance oddly. Um, and I'm going to show you a, a couple of examples in a minute. Um, or let's just talk about ordinary people doing ordinary things. Why do they have to be important, dramatic figures there's really interesting people out there. And you get something like the works of Degas. Uh, I could talk about Degas for pretty much ever. But if you look at Degas, there's this whole empty space right there. Traditional artists didn't like that. There's whole empty space right there. Traditional artists don't like that. Here's the center of the picture. But where is the most important, or the where is what takes your eyes first? Where did you look at first when I put this up? Anyone remember? Where's Gigi? Uh, unmute and tell us. Well, I went right to the dancers. I went at uh, my eyes went to an angle, and then your, I noticed uh, the uh, the violinist. So first, I think I went to them, and then to the left. That's, that's absolutely right. And what Degas has done in this piece is he has created movement for our eyes. So that's, that's what true. our eyes are going to do. They're either going to start on the musician or start on this dancer. But one way or the other, you're going to go back and forth. But you're not going back. Sorry, I'm just going to do this and get you all dizzy. Okay. Uh, you're not going to go back and forth in the center of the picture. That's true. Absolutely. Here's another Monet water lilies. Look at the center opening, empty. His whole action is in a, in a C shape right around. And the brightest part, the lightest part is right up here on the edge of the picture. Huh? No wonder the salon hated this. <laughs> Take a look at this Moriso. Yes, there's a person in the middle, but there's also a per. Sorry, where am I? Here I am. There's a person here on the side who's darker, which means that you might look at that person first. First. And which means that the picture is, yeah. it's overbalanced. Now, yeah, there are ducks or something over here. I think they're ducks. True. But she has done it so that they are almost invisible. They, they look like they're fading into the water. One more, I think. Renoir, who painted ordinary people doing ordinary things. Um, this is called the boating party. He's done many like this. There's, the, there's one where they're all having tea. There's one where they're dancing. Um, and again, if you look, well, look at the center. We don't see much. There's no faces in the center of the piece. Where are all the faces? They're all around the outside. So he's mucked around again with the way we look at work. It's pretty much obvious why. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry. It's pretty much obvious why the Salon hated this stuff. Now, if you've ever been to Paris, um, you've probably had the opportunity to go to um, the gallery that is mostly Impressionist art, which the name of which escapes me because I didn't write it down. Someone fast, tell me. I can't remember. Gone. Can I add something? Please. Uh, okay. Sorry, In David, what was it? David? Uh, Musée d'Orsay, I think. Uh, yes, that's right, d'Orsay. Musée, oh yeah, I know it. Okay, um, Gigi, you wanted to add something. Yes, um, in, that, in the boating party, that is the woman holding the dog 
is Renoir's wife. No kidding. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And I find and it's actually very, very dynamic, this painting, because it goes to show, you know, people, uh, you know, and relationships are what they want. You know, one, one is looking at this guy, this woman is looking at this guy, the guy's looking at a woman, not the same woman that is looking at him. There's a whole play of things. Um, I, I, I find it fascinating, absolutely fascinating. See, this and this one up in the is... corner, this one up in the corner with her hands over her ears? No, <laughs> I don't think that's what she's doing. But look at, again, the play of light. Um, let me just back out a little bit. On these two characters, which makes them the center, perhaps, of the picture. Off center, but the center nonetheless. And the fact that at the center, the guy is in the shadows and his back is to us. Um, yeah, you said this brilliant. is Renoir's wife. I would, that looks an awful lot like Renoir himself. I think it is. I think it is. Because that that's kind of what he looked like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it is him. But I just, I, for example, the, 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 the face, the expression on this woman's face here is similar. Is wonderful. She's listening yeah. to the man who's above her, but the man above her is in shadow. <laughs> so we can't see him quite as well. But he seems like he wants to catch her attention. Well, yeah, he does. Because the man in the in the straw hat is paying zero attention to her. No, he's looking at a guy. He's looking so at... So you see, him. all of this um, human... Uh, he's looking at her, you know, I think. Or maybe at, at her. At her. It's uh, so, in the background, there are two it's guys. so interesting. Yeah. yeah. It, it's exactly how a party happens. Look at how that guy is leaning on the chair the other way around. It's, yeah. it's really yeah. like the moment, as you again. say. And the woman leaning against the bat. Yeah, we could spend hours just on this painting. But I love, take a look at this Renoir's wife. She's having this conversation with the dog. Yeah. She it's might as well. Better. She might as well be alone there. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, what I I want to end with um, is everything that happened in art from that painting in 1873, Impression Sunrise, which I said I was going to go back to, but I guess I'm not unless I just do right now. Um, uh, from then until 1950, so we're talking approximately 100 years, a little bit less, is the art movement known as modernism or modern art. Um, and everything in modern art owes its beginnings to, I guess, Pizarro and gang. Um, yeah. The, the movements that came afterwards, post-impressionism, which actually wasn't after, they were painting at the same time, just completely different style. Um, the uh, Poincelism, uh, Fauvism, yeah. Cubism, uh, Surrealism, they could not have existed had it not been for this gang of artists. Mm -hmm. In 1950, modernism chain ended, and uh, again, it's, it's a date. Uh, and it's because Andy Warhol had his first exhibit and we now have it, we're now in the middle of something called postmodernism, uh, which another lecture for another time. Let me go back to Impression Sunrise, if you don't mind. Um, and let's take a really, if you don't mind spending another few minutes looking at this piece up close. You can see how <laughs> I don't want to show that just yet. How the water is done with those quick brush strokes, the shadow of the fisherman. It's not solid. Again, it's brush strokes and it's a dark green. And the way that dark green was created was by mixing the red in to make Yellow. it darker. No, green and red are the. No, red and colors. blue. No. No, red and green, red blue and, green. and orange. Okay. okay, so 
he's mixed red in there. Now, take a look and, at um, the- I'm sorry, can I just add, um, uh, apparently after pointillism, which was an offshoot of impressionism, that was really the inroad into the age of the digital age, like the 1100 zero, zero and all of that. There were little bits. Yeah, I mean, once once people were experimenting with things like even impressionism, but but also pointillism, um, when computers became the art, a, a viable art form, yeah, they used it. They the the technique was had already been tried. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that, Sandra. Now take a look yeah. at the um, the sun on the water. Um, again, can't a use lot my of their word. paintings illustrate the life of the bourgeoisie of the time. Very much. I'm assuming your name is not oh, Saul, okay. but thank you for that. It, uh, because I mean, all, <laughs> all their women are beautifully dressed. The men are living a very happy, easygoing life. Doesn't look like anybody works. They're in their t-shirts, always on boats or by the marina. So it is that absolutely is true. And I think it's partly because these these artists themselves were not of the working class. Yeah. I mean, Monet owned acres and acres of land that he could make do whatever he wanted so that he could paint it. Um, you know, and and Renoir and and Berthe Morisot as well. She was an upper class lady. Um, I, I suspect it would have looked a lot differently had Van Gogh, for example, been an impressionist. Mm -hmm. who was living absolutely hand to mouth. And the only things he could paint were things that didn't cost anything like sunflowers and his boots yes. because he couldn't afford to buy stuff. Um, yeah. Now he was, was not an impressionist. The, life was good in the 1870s, 1850s. I mean- Well, so for these people anyway, sure. and in Paris. Yeah, and in France, exactly. Yeah. Now, what I also particularly like about this piece, I'm going to back out so that you can see it all, is the um, in industrial, there it is, the industry, the cranes and the factories and the and the lifts and the steam shovels and the things like that that you see at Le Havre Harbor. The um, smoke. The smoke. Look at the sky. This is not necessarily a sky of dawn. This is a sky of pollution. Sunset. So this is the most superficial and briefest I can think of inter, um, of introduction for some of you into the Impressionist movement. Um, and I will now tell the whole group what I told a few people when we were starting, I hate impressionism. Um, I don't like messy. And to me, impressionist art is just that. Somebody, I, I, I think it was in a movie I read, when you get up close, it's a big old mess. And um, it's not the kind of art I do. It's not the kind of art I would run out to see. Of course I have done um, because it's important, but it's not up there with my favorite works or my favorite styles of work. Which That's are, it. can we see, excuse me, can we see some of your art? Um, uh, sure. Uh, let me just go get some. And what style uh, is your preferred style? Um, well, I do, I do abstract myself. Um, I'm, a, I'm an abstract, mostly abstract artist. Um, not all the time, but um, I don't do a lot of realism. And even when I do, it's only semi-realistic. I use things like stencils and uh, a lot of masking tape <laughs> uh, to get straight lines. Um, I'm learning to use watercolor. Um, I'll show you a few of my pieces. Are the works, but... are the works mm -hmm. on the wall behind you yours? Uh, yes. There you go. Yes. Now, if you want to talk about the wall behind me, which I can't see right now because I've just gone to Google Drive, um, this piece, the piece that's sort of, let me just 
the long, tall one that's green and burgundy with the stripes. I'll show you enough close of it. Mm -hmm. The inspiration came from a, a, a stairway. <laughs> so I was standing on the balcony and looking down the stairs. And that's what happened. I will show you a close-up oh, no. of that. This is one of my paintings. It's on the book that I wrote with my dad. <laughs> I didn't see it, I'm sorry. Sandra, I was looking somewhere else. Okay, she's gone. Um, let me just share screen. Um, So that's that's it up close. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Um, Beautiful. So intricate. So it was stairs. I was looking at a stairway, and in my in my imaginings, this had been the banister, and these were the stairs. But I just did them all flat, and it's all done. I laid masking tape down, painted between the masking tapes, lifted it. Acrylic, you can do that after like ten minutes and then laid the masking tape over the painted part and then painted on the other side. Let me just- uh, Very this. interesting effect. Yes. Thank you. I'll show you a couple of others, but I'm not here There's to show you my stuff. There's movement in it. Oh, nice. I like that. And that's How did done with, get, how did that's you get done with gold foil, uh, silver foil. Um, did the painting and then um, I, I rubbed the foil in to get that silvery look. Looks like the pyramids. <laughs> and I thought it looks very like Canada, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the winter, everything is shades of white. It's not really white. But like I, I went through a whole period where I was doing mandalas and this was one of my mandalas. So it looks like the pyramids. The pyramids in the background. Yeah, it wasn't intentional. I was just sort of doing mountains or something. I wasn't Very really thinking metric. about it. Um, this one I painted for my son. Um, so it's sort of realistic, but definitely not. He's got it hanging in his uh, house. Wow. Um, oh, that's a funny story, but I'm not going to tell it now. Nope. That one's hanging in my bedroom. Um, I call this one is fascinating because this is all done here with silver paint. And depending on where you stand, the paint either disappears or doesn't. Um, you can either see those shapes or not. And I call it fading because that's what it does. Mm. Um, what else can I show you? There's one. I, I find like you're that. very neat. I yeah, okay. We don't want all of them. She said she doesn't like Messi. I don't like Messi. Messi, yeah. That's my daughter's dog. Ah, uh, nice. So I do realistic too. I just don't. Right. I do it on demand, not on. These oh. are grain elevators in the prairies okay. where I used to live. Anyway, we don't need to see my stuff. <laughs> I'm watching this. That's zone. beautiful. <laughs> are those silos? Silos, yeah. I call, I call them ghosts. And there's another one. There's a second one. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. A lot of geometric figures. That's what I like. That's why the masking tape. I want you to mention something about Pissarro that I had read, you know, thousands of years ago. But I remember when he came to um, Paris, um, he wasn't perhaps the most uh, uh, famous of the painters. He perhaps wasn't the most adept. However, he had an, as, uh, as uh, Sandra said, he had uh, an influence on the others. Now, what his influence was, is, is uh, I find very telling. What he would do is he would sit at a cafe and others would come to him. So they always went to the same cafe and they came to him. And eventually they started to call him Moses or the judge. No. They, yeah, they they looked upon him as somebody who was fair-minded, perhaps an arbitrator, and uh, he influenced them in that way that he gave them a sense of harmony, uh, of uh, that there was a sense of fairness in their community. He sort of gave them a glue, and um, 
So I thought that was really lovely that, you know, he had that Jewish, uh, perhaps it's a Jewish trait, I don't know, but it's a positive Jewish trait for sure. Yeah, um, to get people together. I mean, who else? But he would didn't it do it on been? purpose. He didn't do it on purpose. It, it, no. it, it uh, generated, it just, it evolved. And, and I want you to say about, um, oh, who is the, uh, well, Degas, uh, I, there's, a, there's some paintings. Do you, remember, do you remember the one in which there's a woman, say she's a, looks like a washerwoman. She's sitting there all in black and she's, she has a very stern, prematurely old look about her and she has an umbrella and she, she's, she's very determined. She's looking at, at the dancers, one of whom is her daughter. And in the background, there is a fellow sitting very nicely dressed and all that. And I remember uh, reading, I think I, was, I read this, I don't know, maybe I was told this, I don't remember how I learned this, um, that older, well, that grown up men would sometimes visit these, uh, these schools for, for girls, dancing schools for girls. And obviously they were interested sexually in young girls. And very often uh, the mother of a young girl, because many of them were not, you know, they had, you, know, you were either rich or you were poor, generally speaking in, in, at that time. So very often the mother would make a deal with a fellow that if she, if he paid for the girl's education, for her food for a year, whatever it was, the girl would have a relationship with him. So there were things like this happening. Well, that's at, that's the that's the story of um, that's been written about the uh, the girl who posed for the the, the sculpture. Whether or oh. not there's any reality to that, I mean, oh. it, it was described in a novel, but nobody actually knows. Oh, okay. And then I think it was Renoir. He was pretty dirty. You know, he looked so nice on the outside, handsome, and and always dressed well. But he, I think he lived with his mother and sister, and he was, you know, filthy-minded and filthy in terms of uh, taking care of himself indoors. And publicly, he was, he was, he had a different image completely. Well, who knew? <laughs> I oh. know. <laughs> But the same with writers. Uh, you, there, you know, there are idols. Yeah, they're, they're, it's amazing. There's so many great, brilliant writers who, if you just look at their works, you, you admire them so much. But then when you start finding out about their lives, how they treated their, their wives, their children, how they did all sorts of disgusting things, uh, it, it's like, you know, two separate people. You have to keep the artist separate from the individual as a human being. Thank you, thank you, Gigi. Okay, uh, people, I'm done. Well, thank you, I loved it. I, well, I always love everything, you know, of, of interest. And this was done. great. Thank you, you. you. Yes, you, um, you handle it so well, I loved it, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Audrey. Oh, you're welcome. It's really beautiful presentation. It's good for the eyes and the ears and everything. Oh. <laughs> Is there a part two? Well, well, you should, uh, a very important Hi, Audrey, uh, is there Okay, a part everyone's two? talking at once and I can't hear it. <laughs> yes, it's Leora. Uh, is oh, there bon, bonjour, Leora. Ça va? Oh, bien, mieux, mieux. Bon, tant mieux. Écoute, euh, est-ce qu'il y a une partie 2 à sa présentation? Uh, non. Oh, pour demander. Mais, mais je, je donne quelque chose pour le synagogue et uh, aussi pour Cummings. Cummings aussi? OK. Oui. My book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Yeah, very enjoyable. And uh, yeah. Please come again. Hello. I hope that uh, that Gladys will invite you again and that you'll want to uh, return. Well, thank you very I, much. I would like. I would like in to six say, in six months' time. I would like to say, <laughs> Audrey, you are so brave. When I called Audrey to invite her, she told me I just had 
a very serious operation that I didn't know about. Uh, me, I didn't know that you had operation. Well, the operation was a result of the illness. It, uh, I had actually two and the third one is on Friday. Oh, oh well. uh, the best of luck and uh, may you heal. Then, then oh. she told me I am having Rapidly and completely. Thank you. She told me I had a serious one and I am having another one less serious, but I will still join you. I will still give you this, uh, the, the presentation that the people ask for it. She is so much, she likes to share her knowledge and everything that she knows mm -hmm. with, that the people, to enlighten the people and make them happy. And we enjoy every week with uh, Audrey on Monday night. She teaches us to, to paint and we love her company wow. all the time. Audrey, you are so brave to share with us with Thank any you. condition you are. And we wish you best of health and many more presentation that you give us. You, you make well, us so you. happy and we like it so much. Many people that didn't come for a long time and now they are with us and it will be on the YouTube and those who couldn't join, they will see it, everything on YouTube. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you all for joining us. We had the Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Gladys. Thank, thank you. you. I'm going to run Audrey, now. Thank, thank you. you, Gladys. Good to see everybody. And thank Audrey, you. Please come back. Thank you, Xenia, for uh, thank doing you, all the back. Yeah, Xenia, I really appreciate your help. Thank you so very, very much. And the office, Francoise and the Viola. And I am going to uh, sign off because I got something else to do. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, we'll see you another time. Wish you a good recovery. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Wow, so nice to see everybody, you guys. Wow, now I see the whole screen. I see Carmen. I see Nina. Nina. I see Evelyn Shaheen. I see Amy. But it's I'm stopping the recording. Okay. I have I to go. I'm going to um, Orlando this 